Good morning, everyone. I'm Faye McCalmont, Director of Cultural Affairs at Western New Mexico University in Silver City. Welcome to this third virtual session of the Transcending Borders Film and Presentation Series. I want to start by thanking our funders, the New Mexico Humanities Council and the National Endowment for the Humanities. Also thanks to the Western Institute for Lifelong Learning for their support of all cultural affairs programs. I'd like to also draw your attention to the fact that we have a short audience survey that we would like you to all complete immediately following the presentation. There will be a live link in the chat box. I think it's already there. And following the presentation, you can click complete and submit that. The link will also be on our YouTube channel where the films are available and on our website and Facebook page. This will help us a great deal. So please look for that link right after the presentation. Thank you. We are going to begin with a short excerpt from the documentary film titled Pottery of Mexico, Volume 2, Trees of Life by Lisa Orr. Then we will go right to Marta for her presentation. So you can also please use the chat box for your questions and then I will get those to Marta and she will answer them following her presentation. Marta Turok was born and brought up in Mexico. Her parents were American expats who arrived in the late 1940s. She received her undergraduate and master's training in anthropology and socioeconomic development at Tufts, Harvard and National Autonomous University of Mexico. Living in Mexico, she has worked in government agencies and NGOs such as the National Indigenous Institute, the Department of Popular Cultures, Phone Art, the Federal Fund for Crafts Development, and the Escuela de Artesanas School of Crafts at the National Institute of Fine Arts. Her work uh, has focused on cultural revival and empowerment, specializing in folk art and crafts with environmental sustainability of raw materials and processes a major concern. She has taught at various universities, worked as curator of national and international exhibits, written dozens of books and articles, and was founding president of the Mexican Association of Folk Art and Culture. She has trained craftspeople and artisans in marketing and the environment, and for 40 years has served as a judge in Mexican craft contests. She has lobbied actively for the preservation of Mexico's sacred purple snail and for other issues related to indigenous culture. She has been coordinator and curator for the Ruth D. Lechuga Center for the Study of Folk Art at the Franz Mayer Museum since 2010. Please welcome Marta Turok. Mi nombre es Soledad Marta Hernández Baez. 
originaria de aquí de Izúcar de Matamoros, Puebla. Un lugar que antes se, se llamaba Ixocan. Y a la llegada de los españoles le pusieron Izúcar de Matamoros porque no podían pronunciar Ixocan. Que mucha gente podría pensar que por el, la caña de azúcar que se produce aquí en Izúcar se llama este, Izúcar, no tiene que ver nada. Y Izúcar viene de un vocablo náhuatl que significa Ixocan. Que tiene dos significados, uno que es donde se labra o donde abunda la oxidiana. Otra, otro significado es lugar donde se pintan la cara. Esta es una de las piezas que más antiguas de cuando yo me casé con mi esposo hace 43 años. La usaban para poner su vela, para alumbrarse y, y era muy este, utilitaria. Se ocupaba para muchas, para alumbrarse porque yo cuando me casé no había luz en este barrio. Y para este, las bodas, que era como muy tradicional dar un árbol de la, de la vida. Era de madera primero, era ir a pedir a la muchacha desde niña, poner un árbol en la puerta de la casa del, de la novia. Y ya después que se casaban, ya entonces a los siete años les regalaban un árbol de, de barro. Cuando me casé con Alfonso Castillo Horta, tenía yo 17 años y él tenía 22. Mi esposo, él, él de su familia, eh, bueno, viene la tradición de la artesanía. Entonces, cuando yo me casé y vi que hacían estas piezas sencillas, que son aquellos, los de dos arquitos, el saumerio, Empezamos a, a tratar de cambiar la, la artesanía, empezamos a hacer figuritas, empezamos a hacer toros, burritos, con candelero, por supuesto. Y luego también hacíamos otros más sencillitos a lo que el cliente pedía. Pero sí empezamos a concursar y empezamos a ganar un, premios, empezamos a trabajar con los tintes naturales, con la cochinilla. Este, y ya de ahí para adelante, pues más concursos, más premios, hasta que se ganó el Premio Nacional de Ciencias y Artes, mi esposo, en el 96. So, I will speak today about Mexico's ceramic tree of life, a, a bit about its history and significance. I will be talking about three centers of production which are in red, Izúcar de Matamoros, in black, um, Acatlán, Puebla, both of them are in the state of Puebla. And then over here in blue, uh, Metepec in the state of Mexico, right? It's practically now been absorbed by Toluca, the state of the, the capital of the state of Mexico. So we'll, we'll do a little spin around. Well, Trees, trees are sacred. Trees are sacred all over the world. Most, most uh, peoples have a special relationship. And this is a tableau from the West Coast. It's called a world tree. 
It's at the American Museum of Natural History. And it's probably from the classic or, or post-classic period, which would be between 900 and 1200 AD. Um, it's beautiful because it's really a 3D depiction of a tree. Although in that area, there is nothing contemporary that uh, takes us to this kind of a, a, a representation. So let's start with Isuka. There are reasons to start with Isuka. Uh, as my friend Elizabeth uh, Cuellar wrote years ago, where it all began. And it's close to Cholula and the Mistec Puebla pottery tradition of what they call codex-like uh, pottery. In other words, that the technique used on the pottery, not on trees necessarily, but on plates and pitchers, has a, a, a series of uh, materials that they put on that is similar to codices. And what I and because it's the Mistec tradition, I want to point out the, the Mistec Puebla tradition, I want to point out something that I think is important, which is the Mistec origin myth, how humankind came about. And they consider that humans were born from the sacred tree in a place called Apoala, which exists. The, the town of Apoala exists. And there's uh, an amazing river and then uh, the sprouting of a spring with a tree, which they think could be what originated the myth. Now, what I want to point out here is these, are, these two depictions are from flat depictions in codices. I want you to notice the structure, how they interpret the tree. You know, sort of a third dimension, with, with these long arms and then these crossbars. In both cases, we've got the same idea of a tree with these crossbars. I also want to point out these flowers and a bit of the colors. The colors are the, in the pinks and the, the burnt orange and the yellows. And this has to do also with another, another codice where sacred birds are depicted on trees, like this, the Quetzal bird with a long, long tail, the, which represents the east, the hummingbird represents the west, the parrot represents the south, and the hawk represents the north. And here I've taken this, this uh, uh, candelabra, the single candelabra with birds on it, with a with the flower on it, with the leaves, and with these hanging hanging um, clay little pieces from uh, Isukat. And you know, I just when I when I started looking at the pre-Hispanic renditions of the of the Mixteca Puebla codices and traditions, I was really amazed by the similarity in colors and a series of similarities. Similarities, I'm not saying that I cannot, I'm not an archeologist, I can't confirm, but, but as you know, when you look at things, you get a feeling and look at this, look at these colors, look at the structure uh, of the flowers. This, this uh, candelabra, this uh, incense burner I inherited from my mom. And I want you to look at this. This is totally pre-Hispanic as the idea of the bird on top of, the, of a leaf and a flower, this flower. There's just this very uh, aesthetic feeling that there could be a connection that survived. Here, for instance, we have similar structures. We have Mayagüel, Mayagüel who is the archetype of the of the mother, the endearing mother. And Mayagüel is also the goddess of pulque, of the maguey plant uh, fermented beverage. And you get the same feeling again, once again, not only the colors and the way the flowers are depicted and the small pieces, but also um, structure, you know? So now let's come into the, 20th century, the latter, the second half of the 20th century, Aurelio Flores was 
really one of the great um, Izúcar de Matamoros artisans. He was the first to start selling to outsiders. My mom would go to Izúcar and buy from him. I don't remember going to Izúcar, but I know it was Aurelio and his son, um, Francisco Flores, who were producing and were very well known outside of Izúcar with, with uh, people who owned stores. The Castillo Horta family, which is not just Alfonso and Marta, there's Heriberto, there's Isabel who is still alive. There were a few brothers and sisters who were producing. They sort of became known a little later. And you must remember that a lot of the folk art was anonymous and it becomes, starts being known by author towards the 60s, 70s, more towards the 80s, and signed pieces don't start until even later. So the, the, it was the Americans, it was people like you who collect, who kept saying, please sign the piece, because a signed piece will have provenance and will acquire certain value, which it wouldn't have if it was anonymous. That's what anthropologists like. We like anonymous folk art, yet, you know, it, I think it's, it is totally fair that the individual be known, always associated to the village and to the context that it is a collective creativity behind underlying create collective creativity. So the Flores family and the Castillo Orta family would be sort of contemporary, maybe the Castillo Orta's a little later than, than Aurelio. Now what happened? When Francisco died, passed away, about 20 years ago, that was it. None of his children continued in the craft. Whereas fortunately with the Castillo Horta, we have a third generation or fourth generation, at least that, that, that we know of in the 20th century. So it has, and there people who worked in their workshops have set up their own workshops. So it is far more vibrant from the school of the Castillo Horta uh, family. <clears throat> Now, as, the, as Marta said in the video, why is it where it all began? Because this is the only place where we can clearly um, identify ritual objects as, the, and, uh, pre, as, as being precedent, preceding what we know today as a tree of life. It wasn't called the tree of life. And one of the important, here we see a photograph of the, the barrios, the barrios have the, for the incense burners, sometimes they have a bigger structure around them. They, they carry these incense burners to the church during certain fiestas. And the candle, the candelabra as my, we say tocaya when somebody has your same name as my tocaya, Marta said, was a gift, a, a wedding, Com compromiso, wedding a pronouncement between the two families. And what I want you to notice is how many arches it has. It has one, two, three arches on both sides, not more. And that, well, this is from Ruth Lechuga. The, the, um, here we have it again, 1960s, a little earlier one, one, two, three three structures. And then we find that in the 70s, maybe the late 60s, and the pioneer is Aurelio Flores, it starts growing, growing, growing. And there are some massive ones, gigantic ones at, in uh, Puebla that suffered from a, a, that suffered from a, an earthquake, but they were restored. And so then you find that as it goes from ritual to decorative, it becomes more sculptural. It is sculptural in essence, but yet it becomes even more sculptural for collectors, for museums, and for collectors and museums, basically. What doesn't change is the color scheme. They just add more elements, no more flowers, more birds, more, more uh, elements, uh, human elements also, the angels. 
And then we have a ritual art transform, the Flores and the Castillo Orta family. So this, for instance, is a tree called the tree of the Puebla, Puebla um, uh, gastronomia, Puebla cooking, you no, know, with all of the talavera and, uh, and some of the dishes and the and the kitchen, the traditional kitchens where that would be with uh, firewood, or you have this one where they've combined the tree of life with the incense burner, so you've got two in one. No, so as Marta said in at the end of the in, at the end of the the clip, she says, "Well, we started experimenting. We started doing different things. So they understood. Maybe they they weren't totally conscious, but they understood that the there was a changing market, and that the consumer wanted novelty. They wanted new things. What do you have to offer? And this is what really got uh, Isuka going on what they have innovated with." Um, here we have another tree, another little tree. And uh, I will end, I'm not dealing with the whole, with all of the people, it's just giving you an idea. And I'm ending with Veronica Castillo, who is their eldest daughter. And she went to live in San Antonio, Texas. And so here we have somebody who's left her home village, she's learned English, she gives courses in how, in, she has a workshop and she gives courses locally. And she's also more of a philosopher. She does very special trees, for instance, nostalgia, the tree of traditional toys and games. Well, that's still more within the innovation, but then she's got uh, nature and woman, a single being. No, and it's it. You go around three three hundred sixty degrees. It's probably about three feet or four feet high. And she was a few years ago. She got a national endowment for the humanities award, a presidential award from the NEA. She also is very much into Guadalupe Tonantzin and and into women's rights. So Veronica, you have in the U.S. and she's producing. Uh, tradition and innovation. And here's a little candelabro from 1972, which is sort of the more commercial aspect, commercial um, isuka pieces that a lot of <clears throat> collectors have. This is a small little piece. It's no, no, no bigger than this, maybe 30 centimeters, 20, 30 centimeters. And so that's another line of and then there is also individual sculptures that I didn't want to go into for this talk. So now let's go to Acatlán, Puebla. Acatlán, Puebla, what we will see is the force and creative genius of Eron Martínez. It's really almost single-handedly one person innovated, broke all of the molds and innovated in, in Acatlán. And as we saw, uh, here's Izúcar, here's Acatlán, sorry, 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 sorry. They're, they're very close, yet Acatlán is more on the, the tradition that goes into Oaxaca rather than the, of the, the original place where fine orange pre-Hispanic pottery was made and is less of the, the Mistec tradition. So here's some pot shards from the fine orange from the post-classic, the, the uh, Evelyn Rattray found where they were produced, which is relatively close to Acatlán, closer to Acatlán than Izúcar. And so in their burnished clay with slips, there was sort of a continuum in, a, in, in doing uh, designs with slips that are very similar in color, no, no contrast. This is a very early piece of, of uh, Eron Martinez. And here we have an animal head. So we're going, and even this, this uh, clay bird, we, we've already getting a little bit, an inkling about sculpture, no? A sculpture head, sculptured head on a utilitarian pot. And this is Eron in the, in the 60s. Eron is also doing trees that are very, that remind us of the of the Izúcar de Matamoros trees with humans though, very clearly humans, very playful, 
we have, of course, the, the angel at the top and the structure, also a candelabra. And then what I found interesting, is one of the ways of always identifying or making it easier to identify Isukat is the very fine, fine geometric designs at the base and on the arms. And if you notice, I'm not saying it's identical, but there is definitely an air of the Mixteca Puebla, the Cholula styles, codice ceramics that are decorated. And here they've sort of made it smaller in scale, but it's completely decorated. No white, no white. That's another point in Mexican sculptural ceramics and much of the folk art Baroque. Terrible fear for white and for, and for un, un, uh, what do you call it, uh, white spaces, you know? So there is, you know, a cross, a crossing of the Mistec uh, Puebla traditions and, and other traditions. For instance, here we have with the, with the conquest, well, we've got the angel and the angel is very, very common in many of the, of the, of the uh, pieces in all three of the, uh, all three of the communities. This, for instance, this flower is also an emblem and these four colors are an emblem that was used by the Tlaxcalans. So, and Tlaxcala is right next to Puebla. So there are things that we can still study and try to identify more of the pre-Hispanic elements that, that are left. Here we have another tree, another lovely tree with, with a, it's the base are the standing, the standing dogs or standing deer, you know, and people on top of the animals and then animals below. The, some people think that this also has to do with the traveling circuses that used to come through the villages and that this was an inspiration. Also, Erona, if you notice, basically right now we've been seeing polychrome, polychrome trees of life that Eron used to do, was well, started with. And then I got to go down, I got to meet him through my mom, and then I got to deal, treat him after that and still visit him. And this is a wonderful photograph by Lenore Hogmel Ryan, and he's holding this sculpture. And Ruth Lechuga, the, the collection that I'm the curator for, happens to have bought one in 1980. And it's a tree where we have the mermaid, uh, we have fish and other, other uh, uh, marine animals. We have the moon, the, su the sun, the moon, and the stars. No? And it's beautiful. And this is it on. He used to work 16 hour, 20 hour a day shifts. He had a big workshop. A lot of the people in the village worked for him. He was very successful and he gave back. He gave back a lot to the community. When uh, in 1974, when the World Crafts Council was held, Council Internet World Meeting was held in Toronto, um, Canada, I was studying at Tufts, so I went over to Toronto. He was the only Mexican featured in the exhibit that was put up. And that's when uh, Octavio Paz wrote the essay, the liminal essay for the In Praise of Hands catalog, and uh, Edom was a part of it. So he was breaking molds in his own village. We already saw how simple the pottery was. Here we have a giant piece. This is, this is Edom, and here we have this gigantic piece. And one of the things that's very important, both in the, in the case of Acatlan, of uh, Isukat, in the case of Acatlan, and as we will see, in the case of, um, Metepec, is how were they able to solve the technical challenges to make larger pieces? Um, how they had to make new kilns, they had to adapt the kilns, they had to find, figure out how to even out the weight so that it wouldn't all break when they put it into the kiln or when they moved it. They were very and are very fragile pieces. However, I want to stress that, that there was a lot of experimenting, a lot of loss of money and effort and time solving each one of these technical issues as they went along. 
Um, so we, we see that Eron started in polychrome and then he went to burnished. And I asked him, well, why did you give up on the, on the polychrome? He says, oh, some archeologists came and they were, they were walking around the hills and, and trying to find uh, the past, our past says, and when I saw those potsherds, I said, there is nothing for me to go on doing painting using store-bought paints. I'm going to really work on the burnishing and make that my, my telltale um, contribution. And so he worked on the slips, he worked on the decoration. I mean, I love this piece. It's, it's like filigree, it's, it's so airy and yet the piece is a big piece. And then here we have one of his students, Pedro Martinez, who's also continued and he works with shades of clay without slips. So one, one is the master and then the students continue and add on. Then we have syncretism in structure and theme, cross fertilization, because the Adam and Eve tree of life is more what we will see immediately afterwards is more the, the contribution of, of, Isu, of uh, Metepec Yet we see uh, Eron Martinez doing a rendition of a tree of life with Adam and Eve and with these wonderful uh, pre-Hispanic like decorations. And in, in speaking a few weeks ago with the Casbal brothers, they told me that they had heard that maybe there was a Jewish relation, a Jewish influence in Isukat and that they might've done menorahs at some point. We have to research, we have to find out, we have to see more in collections. Actually, most of the collections are in the US, both museums, private collectors picked up on these things and took them uh, out of Mexico. In Mexico, it took a little longer for things to be appreciated. There are important pieces in collections, yet not in the quantity that there are in the States that would allow us to do stylistic um, studies or research. So here we have more cross fertilization. Um, Augurio Martinez did a Metepec style tree. And I mean, I could be fooled. I could easily be fooled. So, you know, you, you start trying to see how do I, how important is it to identify where it's made? How important is it for this cross fertilization not to become a copy? And I'll deal with that a little further on. So now let's go to the to this part, which is Metepec state of Mexico. As I pointed out, it's right next to Mexico City. Basically, uh, they were Matlacinc, and then they were conquered by the Aztecs in the in the 14th century. And so they have their own tradition. It's not really directly related to the Puebla tradition. Here we have a, a close up of the map, and um, and what, what was Metepec known for and has been known for? 90% of the production was always utilitarian pottery. Big cazuelas to do mole for, for small, medium, large cazuelas. They were also known for pulque. It's a pulque producing region. And once again, we find an animal head. So we're, we're seeing part of the tradition of a little bit of sculpture in it and with a very, very sweet little jar. The pulque comes out of, out of the mouth and you've got your little jar so you can drink pulque. And then I had interviewed, I, at the end I'll show you the, uh, a publication that I participated thanks to Lenore Hogma Ryan a catalog and an exhibit that was hosted at the UCLA Fowler Museum in the 90s. Anyway, so when I interviewed the, the family, the uh, Soteno family, I said, well, you know, what were you doing? What, was, what other things were being produced? And they said, oh, we used to do the clay molds for the sh sugar caskets and the skeletons for the Toluca Alfeñique figures. These would be Day of the Dead candy, fi candied figures. So these, these would come from a mold made in Metepec. So we have another 
sort of traditional connection between Day of the Dead and and um, and Metepec, but not they weren't producing Day of the Dead figures. Here we see the figurative ritual ceramics as an antecedent of the of of the Tree of Life. One would be the crushes, the crush, the nacimiento, and this is the most important piece. I'll have a better a full picture in a minute, and which are the curing figures. These were ceremonies done by a shaman in Metepec, and they were highly, highly specialized. We'll go to the next slide so you can get a bit better picture of it. 36 pieces and uh, a king, a queen, people dancing, a music band, women preparing food, tortillas, um, the dough on the metate, animals, people with in a procession with, with candles, and then these strange animals here, the serpent, and, th and this is the most important piece. Well, then you have the um, arcoiris, the when it rains, you get the, well, you know rainbow. what I mean, rainbow. Thank you, <laughs> sorry for that. The rainbow, but this is the most important piece. This is the called the wind sucker. So the curing ceremony has to do with being ill and having a curing ceremony and all of the pieces would be put next to the sick person. We'll, we'll have a tree rendition made of the curing ceremony. And this, would, this piece would be placed under the sick person's bed. And the curing ceremony would be to suck the illness out of the sick person. And then when we get to the tree, you'll see what would happen. And the uh, Sotenos would tell me, well, when the shaman ordered the curing ceremony series that was paid for by the sick person, that day, that week, we would eat meat. Otherwise, we were eating only frijoles, beans, and, and tortillas for most of the time. So the mother, Modesta Fernandez de Soteno, is the counterpart of, of um, Eron Martinez and Tito Reyes, I'm sorry, and, and the Izucat families as the innovator. Very clearly, she is the innovator with her adopted father, Tito Reyes, starting. So, we have another ritual piece, the clanchana, which is decorative, yet it's ritual, and I'll, I'll get into that in a minute. We have this photograph um, where Darío Soteno, who is her, her husband, this is um, Modesta, this is Modesta's aunt, and we have other people, some of them are still alive today from the Soteno Fernández families, and Enter in the scene, Diego Rivera. These, this, this uh, mermaid and these pieces here, which are parts of the curing ceremony, not the whole thing, are found at Frida Kahlo's Blue House. So we, we start seeing a connection with an outside person. Here we have the Soteno dynasty. Alfonso is the now living old eldest son. His brother, his older brother passed away um, a few years back. His wife, his son, Oscar, uh, his wife, their son, and they're holding the same picture that we just saw. Here we have Alfonso with Oscar, with uh, their daughter uh, and, his, their, and, and Oscar's son and daughter who are university, They've gone to the university, studied other things, but they're doing pottery. They're, they're, they haven't lost, they, they have their one foot doing pottery and one foot with what they've studied. And then we have Tiburcio Soteno and his sons Israel and Carlos. Tiburcio is uh, uh, Alfonso's brother, the next down. And they, they're also, they, they were, they have been sponsored by Chloe Sayer for years and she takes them to Europe and she takes them to Canada and they do special trees. They're, they're very productive and they have traveled the world, so to say. 
Another decorative sculptural pottery piece is the Pegasus, no? From, and this Pegasus was probably a, a horse and they added uh, wings and so it became a decorative sculptural piece. Here we have our mermaid again, 1965, from the Ruth Lechuga collection. And then we have Oscar taking the mermaid and just building her up and putting all sorts of uh, things relating to the sea. Now, why the mermaid? What makes the mermaid important? Well, turns out that there is a, I think it's here, no. There is a pre-Hispanic goddess of the waters, Chalchi, Chalchicutle, and of all of the waters, not the sea, the, the, uh, where the, um, what, what do you call the manantiales would be the, uh, where water sprouts, the, um, somebody help me. Um, spring water. Spring. spring, where the spring waters are, those are sacred places in all of Mexico. They're, they're very tender, careful, so that the water comes out and is pure. And it is also the, the place where the mermaid lives. In other words, the pre-Hispanic goddess after evangelization and conquest became a mermaid. And when I read that, and then I understood why in the middle of Mexico, you have a mermaid when they're so far from the, from the ocean. So that's, that is a reason. And then it turns out that um, the, the sprouts around Metepec are where the Lerma River is born. And it goes all the way into Jalisco. Chapala is part of the Lerma River. And then from there to the ocean. And one day, well, it didn't take a day, but at some point, the Mexican government, Mexico City government and the federal government, because they're here, it's like the District of Columbia. We, we share the city and, and the, the federal offices, decided they needed water. So they took the Lerma River and brought water to Mexico City. And so the older people, this happened in the 50s, more or less, 40s, 50s, the older people said that one day the, the sirena, one day the uh, mermaid decided she wanted to leave and she went to Mexico City. And it's the way that they, that they reinterpret the history of the loss, the direct loss of the spring waters, the, the, where the spring waters sprout and are taken to Mexico City. Now we go on to our real, our, the, the, the real McCoy, which would be the tree. So we've got a different sense, the European sense of origin, the origin myths, the Judeo-Christian Judeo Genesis, which is Adam and Eve, and the forbidden fruit as being the origin of humankind. And this tree that is a part of the Ruth Lechuga collection, bought in 1942, she arrived in Mexico. She was a uh, Austrian Jewish refugee from, from uh, the Crystal Night and World War II, and the Nazi invasion of, of Austria. They arrived at the end of the beginning of 39. They leave in 38 and arrive in 39. She buys this in 42. Well, this has a little story of its own. Um, sorry, this repeats, this repeats, this repeats. Oh. These were, I supposedly moved them, but I guess I didn't. So it turns out that Alfonso Soteno had told me, um, Diego Rivera bought a tree of life an Adam and Eve tree of life, similar to Ruth Lechuga's way back. He met my mother in the, in the Friday weekly market of Toluca, which is no longer existing, like the Tianguis, the weekly Tianguis. And then he started going to the house. He never talked about Frida going to, to Metepec. I don't know why. However, I was looking at this book of the Giselle Freund photographs at the Casa Azul 
She's in, she comes to Mexico, meets the, 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 the Rivera Kahlo family, a couple. She lives in their home and takes a lot of photographs. And there's a book that was published in 2014, I think. And I have this habit of buying everything that comes out of, of on Frida and Diego, especially Frida, because I've worked on her wardrobe. So I'm always looking for photographs. And lo and behold, I find two very important photographs that I have now shared, since shared with, with the family, and they're very excited. This tree is no longer in the collection. However, here is an earlier version, probably an earlier version of Ruth Lechugas, and we have the basic tree, we have the apples, we have the serpent, and the serpent is handing the apple to, to, um, to Adam, and here's Eve. And one of the interesting things is how the upper part of the body is better proportioned than the lower part of the body. And my intuition is that it comes from the, the way that the, the uh, curing ceremony figures were made where the bottom parts are not very, uh, well, you're never gonna have a, them naked. And so this, is, this part was not worked on as much. So you have a relationship between the figurative ceramics, the tree of life. There are two theories and all of the original people are not around for us to ask. One, the, the, the Soteno family says that Diego Rivera suggested they do the Tree of Life and other people of the community and a researcher from France say that this was actually a tree that was uh, done, uh, suggested by the Jesuit, the Franciscan priest that, that did evangelization and that, um, that they used it as a tool for evangelization. They said, okay, well, you know how to do pottery. Here, we're gonna do different parts of the Christian uh, Bible. And that's how in, for teaching the Genesis, this came about. So we'll never, I don't think we'll know what, if there is a single truth, we have two ideas, no, coming. So here it is on the mantelpiece the, at, the, at the Casa Azul. And on the left is, the Genesis, and on the right is our Clanchana, our, our mermaid. So this is how, now this is gone. It probably was too delicate. And the mermaid is still at the Casa Azul, as I mentioned. And then there's another photograph. And that's of a tree, of an actual tree. And I said to Alfonso, oh, look. He says, oh, that's an early tree. I said, a little crooked, isn't it, Alfonso, if you notice? He says, yeah, we were just learning how to do the bigger trees. So it's fascinating because, you know, through, through a couple like the Riveras who had a relationship with the Sotenos, we see how the tree, how the Adam and Eve uh, Genesis tree starts becoming a tree. And this is called, uh, Alfonso calls it a palma, a palm leaf. And he says that that is the family's signature of their trees are the palmas. Then when I did the interview, I interviewed various families about the history of the tree in, in, um, in Metepec. They said that after the Genesis and after the trees with the different aspects of the Genesis, we'll see another one. The next tree was called the spring tree of life, the Arbol de la Primavera, and it actually wasn't the Sotenos, it was um, Ortega, the Ortegas who started with that. So we begin to see that the tree already has a very complex structure and, uh, and a lot of, a lot of um, this one is part of the Sotenos, but it's the best example I could find of a, of a spring tree of life. So we start seeing that the tree is gonna start having different themes. It's going to, like similar to Acatlan where they did the, the Puebla kitchen and, and food theme. Here it, they go to the spring tree of life. This is an enormous tree. It's uh, done by Tiburcio. It's at the Dolores Olmedo Museum. And you're going to have God the Father. You're going to have an archangel. It's so Baroque that it's hard to get into it. 
many, many uh, flowers and, and uh, details. And um, then now we come to the curing ceremony tree. Uh, Ruth had a very good relationship with the Sotenos and she, Carlos, so Carlos Moises was very young at that time. And she talked to him about her curing ceremony set. And he said, oh, I'll do a tree that shows how the curing ceremony would take place so that you can have your curing ceremony in your collection and the tree. And so this is a wonderful one of a kind piece. And we see the king and the queen, the musicians, we see the food being made, making the food, the um, more musicians. Here's the person, the sick person, the, the, the wife and the child crying, very concerned. And here are the pieces, the important pieces that are placed around the, 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 the bed and under the bed. And then when the curing ceremony is done and the bad air, the malos, uh, the malaire has been taken from the sick person, they would go to a cave and put the whole 36 set in the cave. So probably in and around Metepec caves, there are a lot of examples of these uh, trees of life, I'm sorry, of the curing ceremony 36 pieces. When People started, Carlos Espejel was the first to ask them to make one to sell, not the tree, the pieces. They were scared to death because the shaman had said, this is a ritual sacred piece. You will never do it as a decorative piece. He had passed away, nobody had taken on. And so Tiburcio told me with great fear, they did their first uh, curing ceremony set. It, actually, it was Dario, their father, who used to do it. That's who uh, Ruth had bought it from. And then it became part of the folk art for sale. Then this also became a very well-known uh, tree of life, inspired in Como Agua para Chocolate, like water for chocolate, Laura Esquivel's uh, award-winning um, uh, novel and after that her her then husband's uh, movie como agua para chocolate so they did that and they're constantly being asked for different kinds of themes and then well of course in mexican irony you have a tree of life that depicts death so <laughs> the arbol de la muerte and uh, all the flowers become skulls and there's a central skull and, and many other little skulls. And then of course there are flowers too. And so this is part of this way of sat the satire and irony of life and death in, in Mexican folk art and Mexican traditions. And this, even though it's not a tree, it's part of Ruth's collection. I love the piece. It's, uh, it's uh, Pedro Soteno who's another brother it said, well, this is the wake, the wake. And then when I interviewed him, he said, well, it was like, I, I thought of a death has permission to come out of the, this death figure, sees that everybody's having a great time. Some are playing, some are crying, but most of them are having a good time. And a lot of them are gossiping, probably gossiping about him. And so he wants to be a part of the party too. So he's going to, he's opening his casket so he can join the fiesta. This piece was, was of my property, oh, excuse me, was my property and it ended up in Germany, unfortunately. I had to part with it. And it is a tableau, it was a gigantic tableau, you know, almost two feet, uh, no, two meters by, by 180. And it's a depiction of the most important fiesta of Metepec, which is, in honor of Saint Isidore, the, the patron saint of, the, uh, agri of agriculture, yet it's never performed on that date because I then researched that it had to do with the old Matlasink uh, ritual calendar. I won't go into much detail because I'm running out of time. Then we have gigantism here. We have a clay pot with a tree of life on top that depicts uh, Noah's Ark. So, you know, you have things that they're trying to figure out to be creative. This is a few years old and it gets a little 
heavy there. Uh, some people love it and some people find it too much. That we have, I was a jury at a contest in uh, Guadalajara, in Tlaquepaque, and we had cross-fertilization. We had people of Metepec doing alebrijes. And then we have Oscar Soteno, who did a homage to Pedro Linares, the great uh, inventor of alebrijes, creator of, of a lot of alebrijes, and also in uh, paper mache sculptures. And this is this, the original is a famous piece by Pedro Linares that's called Death Revived, you know, death. You've had the death figure and then life comes out of death, you no? Know? Life is reborn. And so he asked the Linares permission to render it in clay. So again, cross fertilization. And when I sort of saw a lot of this going on, I said to Tiburcio one day, I said, I, Tiburcio, well, what's all this copying? He said, no, don't look at it as copying. Take it easy, Marta. We adopt, we adapt, and we share, we, we give. So they're, they're not as uh, concerned as some of us are. And here, just a little a collage, you know? So we have a tree of life, of, a tree of the genesis of Adam and Eve, we have it in Ruth's collection and it had it at Casa Azul um, and, the, and the early, a very early tree of life. We have the candelabro, the, the, real, the real ritual candelabro. We have these magnificent, gigantic uh, trees of life. And then a few years ago, about 10 years ago, I visited, I, I visited uh, Metepec and the Soteno family as a whole had an exhibit at a gallery, a local gallery, and um, uh, Is um, Isaac's daughter had made this rendition, this homage to her grandmother of a tree of life. So I, I, I was the first one to buy a piece by her. She's now 15. She's doing wonderful work. So once again, we have it going another generation, fortunately. So just to sum up, we've got a, some, each place had traditional things. Each place had something that was going to become the, the antecedent, the, the, the precedent of what is today the tree of life in these three villages. And there's been a big trend for monumental and sculptural ceramics that derive in all three places because they've been driven by collectors, by the Mexican government who sometimes has commissioned these gigantic pieces and they evolved between the 30s and the 50s. There's a very similar timeline. They're nurtured by artists, by galleries, by folk, uh, folk art galleries and collectors. And I think one of the things to stress is there's a lot of experimentation in the 60s to solve the technical problems in structure and firing. And the tree of life is now considered emblematic of Mexican folk art, but it's the second half of the 20th century phenomenon when it actually happens. And this is the catalog, it's out of print, but you can probably look for it uh, through Amazon and other, other um, uh, secondhand book uh, um, sites. Ceramic Trees of Life, popular art from Mexico, Lenore Hogue Morayan, who, who since passed away, with um, essays by Dina Komisarenko, Elizabeth Cuellar, and myself, I wrote about Metepec precisely. And so you can get more information uh, on, on each one of these histories. And well, that's what I wanted to share with you today. And we can... Wonderful. Thank you so much, Marta. That was fantastic. <laughs> um, now, to the audience, do you have any questions for Marta? Please put them in the chat box. We'll take I'm a few meeting. minutes. Anne Hedlund. Hello, Anne Hedlund. <laughs> so nice to see you. Oh, you're living in, in Silver City. Hope I, I can make it to Silver City. We're, we're textile companions. <laughs> Uh, what else do we have? What is the significance of mermaids in Mexican art? Uh, is there a myth associated with mermaids? It's okay. Well, 
I thought I had explained it. Um, I think I think she may have typed that while you were talking uh, about. Yeah, it's earlier, right? It's in so yes. Water is sacred. Mini Wikoni. I think it's just a comment. Ah, so there's okay. a there's another question right down below there. Do you think the 21st century has brought a lot more mass marketing versus collector marketing of Mexican artesanía? If so, how does that affect the art or artist? It's two lines. It's it's parallel lives. You have collectors still working with uh, collecting vintage pieces, looking for vintage pieces from collections that are uh, the, the pieces that still come up. You have uh, the new generations, which is what I, I think it's very important to nurture the, the children of the masters and also other young people, because the more there are, the, the livelier, the, the, the uh, livelier the experimentation and new directions are. And then you have poor families or people who, who are looking for pieces that are not as pricey as or costly as the master's pieces. So some families do the, the, the more commercial things. That's why I pointed out to that last little piece at, at the end of the, the segment on Izúcar. In all three places, you're going to have day-to-day -day livelihood production, and you're going to have special commission pieces. Contest Mexico is one of the countries in the world with the most active contest programs. And the contests have always nurtured uh, creativity. Oscar had told me, that's just a quick anecdote, but it's very telling. When I interviewed Oscar, he said to me, well, my dad insisted that he wanted me to come home with a college degree. And I said, well, father, if you want a college degree, okay, I'll do college, but I really love pottery. And that year, he won the best of the whole contest in, in Tlaquepaque. And he said to his father, I am more than ever convinced that I want to be a potter. So I, you know, when you were talking, Faye, about uh, my, my resume, I tried to get the Ministry of Education to give a formal recognition to traditional artisans because it is a body of knowledge. And I was coming along and they were interested and I kept telling them, the parents and the children keep telling me that a diploma would help. And there was some politicking against me and that was the end of that, so, such is life. And then I, I kept asking, you're, you're in a, an educational field, Faye, so you, you know what it is. And, and I called this program, this, this uh, idea, the recognition of traditional, uh, savoir faire of, of how we, knowing how to do, and then with various categories, depending on your degree of mastery and recognition. So, you know, then the young people started asking me, but am I gonna make more money with that degree? I said, no, the degree will give you recognition, social recognition, but it will not automatically give you economic recognition. For that, you need to take courses in marketing, in now, I would say now you've got to learn how to handle social media because a lot with, and you know, Faye and, and uh, Macon's over there from Los Amigos del, del Arte Popular and um, our dear friend uh, in Chapala with uh, Maestros, FOFA, Friends of Oaxacan Folk Art have been so active, so incredibly active during COVID pandemic and opening up the venues for the artisans to sell, to say, okay, here it is, it's open, you can sell. Now, who's gotten stuck? The pottery, especially the pottery artists, because they don't know how to pack, and they don't know how to send, and the, uh, the breakage is very, it's a big risk, and many of the companies are not accepting that you, that either to transport it or that you uh, pay a premium. A, an insurance, they say, no, it's, it's not good. So, you know, one thing opens up another and these are the things that they would have to master and have an alliance with industrial designers who design packaging so that they, especially potters can, can sell their things in and keep getting them out. 
Okay, and so Mitzi Lin, interesting presentation. I have a large tree of life, which may, may have come from Acatlan. Natural barro, most likely. Really nice to learn that mermaids are related to, to springs, yes. Um, bravo, and hello, hello. Can you talk a bit about any differences in women versus men's roles? And also any roles that children play in the designing, making, marketing. There's a colleague of mine who has focused in, gen in, ter in general terms in Mexico on studying the role of women artisans in, in setups and family setups where the men have been dominant. And she worked with Isabel Castillo Horta and with Isabel's sons. And she feels um, that in, in, in uh, places where men and women work together, it's the men who tend to get the credit. They're the ones who sign the pieces, not the women. And so she feels that there's been a, a question of discrimination and gender discrimination. And she has been working towards raising awareness so that each, that, that's when the whole debate of anonymous, signed, can play a very important role because then each person can sign their piece and also get the, the due recognition that, that it comes to them. So we're finding, I mean, that's why I also included Veronica because Veronica is mm -hmm. really very um, much of a, of a uh, feminist and, and it shows in her work and having lived in the States, she's also more and she's very conscious of things, of social roles that maybe in her village would not have been, she would not have been able to express the same way. So nice information. Please do more of these. That, that's for you. Yes. <laughs> uh, the shards there have a theme with the same designs as the Mimbre shards we find here. Yes, I've, I've, I've worked for many, many years with Mata Ortiz. And um, yeah, it's because it's two tones. There's a two tone thing and it's wonderful. I'm not sure that there is a direct connection. There are other connections between the Mimbres and the, and the Mata Ortiz traditions with the South, but more research would have to be done on that. Also the Teotitlecas in Oaxaca make all sizes of tree of life out of beeswax as ritual offer offerings for engagement rituals. Yeah, well, I know that at, I've never been, and thank you, Mitzi Lin. Um, as soon as I can get out of this house, because I've been locked up since March 16th, um, I would at some time, this is an end of the year petition, uh, end of the year ritual done in Teotitlan del Valle and a few other villages in the valley, and they make, uh, figures out of beeswax and they go up to the top of the hill and they are petitions. They are to ask for whatever the, the figure is, if it's money, if it's a house, if it's animals. And so these figures are done for, for that and then they're left there until the next year where they go back up the hill. So it's, it's a ritual folk art that doesn't really come into the market. Very, you know, it does not become a part of the market. So what else do we have here? That's as far as I've gotten. Anything else, Faith? No, I think that's no? good. I was going to say that um, our event that you were scheduled to appear at and, and speak at physically in Silver City was <laughs> uh, Fiesta Latina. And we are hopeful that we can actually do the event this coming June. And the dates are the 18th to the 20th. And you and I will be talking about hopefully being able to bring you here physically. Yes. Uh, because, uh, <laughs> this was a wonderful lecture. And we'd love to hear more because I know you have a lot more to talk about. Uh, we have had the Caswell brothers here. Um, and yeah. they are very popular. They're wonderful um, trees of life. And so they'll be back. We've also had the um, Patricia Castillo of the Castillo family yeah. and Marta, her mother. And so we've had a number of these artisans here at our event and hope to have them back. And um, also just, I wanted to say that, you know, I've, I've got a number of pieces from children who are producing pieces in Mata Ortiz. Someone had mentioned something about the children. Uh, artists. Yes, so I, I know that. Yeah. 
they're definitely passing that on to the children there. But um, And then our next uh, lecture will be December 8th. It's kind of a bonus presentation. We're going to feature four films that the um, Artisan Institute in Michoacan has produced. And they'll be about masks, the pineapple ceramics, um, lacquer and lacquerware and, and copperware. And so we've had all of those artisans represented here at Fiesta. And so that'll be on December 8th at 10 a.m. right here again. And so it looks like we've gone through all the questions. And Could I make one comment, Faye, about sure. the children? Uh -huh. Yes. Um, I've been very concerned because the uh, there, there is an international movement against child labor, and that has extended to crafts. And um, it's like, is there any children's work in this? And I'm going, well, how else are they going to learn? How are we going to keep this going if things are, if, if you prohibit? So the, when, when I was able to speak to the then director at UNESCO for folk, for crafts in general, and there was going to be an international meeting in Manila, which I wasn't able to participate. I said, Indrasen, I'm very concerned. I think that they're taking the Pakistani and Afghani experience of, of the children in sweatshops doing uh, oriental carpets and have, are extending it to everything point blank. And it's dangerous. I said, otherwise, what it, we don't have schools. We, it, it's not something that they go to school to learn their crafts. So how can we do sidebars, sidebars so that we nurture the children, as you said, Faye? So it, 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 in Mexico, they, they are learning. They're not learning that many. We have a tremendous loss, tremendous loss across the board of young people or children learning their craft. The parents want them to go to school. They say, you want to live in this poverty? So it's in certain places where the craft is successful, where we do have a new generation coming in. And as I pointed out, Oscar's uh, children studied at university and they've decided to stay within the craft of uh, Tiburcio's two children. Carlos didn't go to university. Is is Israel went to art school and he said, you know what? Not my not not what I want to do. And so he sort of does innovate within tradition with more of an artistic sense. So there are new scenarios happening. I wish, and many of the artisans wish, that the artisans had a university and that they didn't have to go to art school. They said art school is a whole different perspective. And most art schools in Mexico tell the artisans' children oh, it's so good that you're now in art school because then you'll stop being an artisan. Mm. So we have this hierarchical vision of what is art and what is craft and it doesn't help. So just, I just wanted to point this out, Faye. Well, thank you for that. And I was gonna say additionally that Fiesta Latina, our event here, we, um, we gave special funding for the artisans that wanted to bring their their children with them, their um, older children. So we had a number of them bring their teenagers with them and they you know, showed us their artwork and also had their artwork on display and were also uh, doing um, demonstrations. And so that was a pretty successful thing too. And we hope to start that up again as well to encourage them to come. Now they were all in school, you know, in high school, um, but, uh, but they also wanted to carry on the art. So I, I guess that's a, you know, something that we can do from our end to help Yes, nurture, to nurture yes. and to give them confidence and, uh, and, and uh, by buying the things, you're also telling them there is an economic uh, possibility to live with yes. this, live, yes, live from right. this. Well, okay, I guess that's the end of our presentation. Thank you all for joining us. Please do fill out the evaluation form in the chat box. It's at the top of the chat box. And I think, oh, the survey, excuse me, not evaluation, it's a survey. The link is on there now again at the bottom. Please, please do fill that out for us. It helps us with our funding. And so we appreciate that very much. And once again, thank you so much, Marta. That was fantastic. I'm sure if you could see everyone, they would be clapping their hands because it was very informative. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank you, thank okay. you to everybody. See you soon. Okay.